Okay, so everyone say this with me. The minister, the manager, and the mystery. Say it again. The minister, the manager, and the mystery. I actually always forget. Can you all see the screen? Can you? Pass my big fat head. Is that better though? Oh, is it worse? It's just the same? That's okay. Well, that's, I just I wasn't sure if you could see it or not. Anyway, that's okay. So we're going to continue with our study in the book of Colossians. Hope that is okay. And um, so obviously tonight is called The Minister, The Manager, and The Mystery. And uh, it is, of course, a pleasure to be sharing with you all once again. My apologies for not being out this morning. I was stuck on the runway in London Gatwick. And they actually had to call, while we were on the plane, they had to call two staff and get them out of their bed so the plane could actually take off. They didn't have enough staff working. So if you're going on holiday watch out. I'm going to France next week. They better have it sorted. I think it's a week after, actually, but um, I had a good time in London. It was warm, so I've got a bit of the, the sun about me. Um, everyone enjoy the Jubilee? Yes. Yes? yes? We had an amazing party here on Thursday for all the oldies. Um, well, the old Ronnie was even there. Brilliant. <laughs> sure, you didn't see. You think you're young, but you, you think you're too young, but you're not. And uh, we really had an amazing time. And um, thank you for everyone for supporting that. I know Angela, Jack, and Suzanne and the team um, all really enjoy being with you all. Um, so just a, wee, just a wee quick recap. Oh, before I start, um, I was saying to Alan and Joan earlier, there were three people sleep, sleeping last week while I was speaking. So I'm going to see tonight if I can beat that record. And they were all sitting around the front. Just see, one of them's Alan Wright, because he's not here. I can, I can name and shame him. And there was a few others. Ronnie, uh, so, uh, <laughs> look, I know the heat gets to, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm nagger today, but look, we'll try and get through this, and do your best to stay awake, and, and, if, you, and if you think you're going to sleep when you're here, paint, paint fake eyes on your eyelids, and then I'll know you're not sleeping, all right? So as we know, Colossians um, was written around AD 64 by the Apostle Paul, we know all this, and his young friend Timothy. And we know from last week, and as we learned right at the start, Paul is under house arrest in Rome, and he's being held captive um, by the great power that is the Roman Empire. Um, why? For preaching the gospel and for witnessing of the love and grace and the transformational power of Jesus Christ in his life. And while under house arrest, uh, he writes there to his beloved and to the beloved and faithful saints, as he calls them in the start of chapter one, there in the city of Colossae. And uh, he writes um, to the fellow believers, to fellow believers that we know he has never met face to face, but we know uh, that from his compassionate and caring words, alongside some words of warning, that Paul loves the ecclesia. We looked at that, the called out ones, the church um, there in Asia Minor. And if you remember, um, way back to parts one and two a few months ago, one of his close allies and friends in this work of ministry, ministry, does anyone remember his name? Epaphras, you remember him? He's a good guy. He had brought to Paul there in Rome uh, a radiant report. He had brought a report of all that was happening uh, through the believers in Colossa and to the believers in Colossa. And now Paul was writing to them after hearing this radiant report, writing directly there into their situation in Colossa in AD 64. <laughs> And you know, that report, as I've said, the one that Epaphras brought was mostly a commendable report, but it did include some issues uh, that were going on at the church there in Colossia. And Paul, simply because of his love, his big heart, his heart of service and that shepherd's heart that he had for them and for Jesus, uh, included in this letter, he also, um, there was also some words of warning, correction, instruction. And we've read a few of those words already as we've journeyed through chapter one. Friends, look, let's be honest with each other tonight. No church is without its issues, okay? Unfortunately, at the minute and over the last few years, there's been too many church splits, too much division, too much infighting, too much debate, too many people walking away and, 
and doing their own thing. Where there are people, there will be problems. Now, where you are, there will be problems. Isn't that right, Hugh? Where I am, there, <laughs> where I am, there will be problems. Look, where there's people, there's problems. And it's not just the church. It's in work. It's in your home. It's, it's everywhere you go in the world. And this church in Colossa is certainly no different. Don't be, don't, don't be under the impression that all these places that Paul wrote to in the New Testament were these perfect fellowships where everyone loved each other all the time and they all got on. They got on each other's wick sometimes. That's just the way we are. But remember here in Colossa that, that, this false, that some false teaching had made its way into the church and many were being drawn away into Gnosticism. Okay? Being, what they were being told was that, you know, Jesus Christ... He's not enough. He's not as sufficient enough as Lord and Savior. That other spirits, whether they were pagan or superstitious or whatever, alongside this kind of encouraged worship of angels, they were being told that all of these things were needed in addition to faith in Christ, that faith in Jesus alone wasn't enough. But Paul gave the Colossians a clear and firm no. Stop it. That is not true because Jesus is all that you need. He is the, what did Paul write about him? He is the fullness of deity and the revelation of the divine nature in human form. In him alone dwells all the fullness, as Paul wrote, and in him alone is found all that's needed for salvation and life. Redemption, and a word we've talked about a lot, reconciliation with God the Father. And we also found out that all of these things pleased God. And that was an incredible truth. And in part 10 last week, we learned that Paul, uh, this faithful apostle of Jesus, was a minister of the gospel. We looked at that word minister. Paul spoke about himself. He referenced himself. He called himself a minister of God or a servant of the Lord, a bond servant. One who was called to do the bidding of his master and uh, his master being Jesus Christ. Look, we know Paul's life had been completely transformed and changed on that Damascus road in Acts 9. And he was now in the service, in devoted service of the one who had saved him from his life of evil and wickedness and sin, as, as the Lord has done for all of us. Amen. Paul had himself been rescued and reconciled. And last week's study, we talked about suffering in service of Savior and saints. There's my clicker. Told you, forgetting everything tonight. There we read together verses 24 to 26 of Colossians 1. And Paul spoke to the Colossians of how he was rejoicing in his sufferings. He was rejoicing in that hardship and that affliction and the pain that he was facing in his current situation. And I spoke a little about how I found that so strange that someone would actually rejoice in their sufferings and how that's not normal for us, even as the people of God. But Paul viewed his own suffering as, as an extension, as a continuance of the suffering that Jesus had suffered during that earthly ministry at the hands of those who did not want him, who did not want to hear his words, the words of truth that he came to speak. Those, we know about those in Galilee, in Judea, in Palestine, who rejected that message of reconciliation. They rejected the words of compassion from Jesus, from the Son of God. There were those who had their heads and their hearts stuck in strict religious practice and their perversion um, of God's holy law. That's what it was. Those who in the end wanted Jesus put to death at the hands of the Romans. Those who stood there on that fateful day and cried, crucify him, crucify him. They did not want him as Messiah. They pushed him away. They pushed him out. And they accused him of blasphemy and of making the claim to be equal with God, which he was. He certainly was. Paul saw his sufferings as an extension of this for Jesus, but also for his body, the church, the called out ones. And Paul rejoiced in all of this pain, all of this anguish, all of this persecution for the sake of his body, which is the church. And Paul continues, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship, stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. We know from last week, from verse 24, that Paul does consider himself a minister of God. Now we find out that this role that Paul had, this responsibility that, that, that was given to him, 
was given by the stewardship of Almighty God Himself. A few weeks back, so maybe a month or two ago, I shared about uh, on a Sunday morning about the parable of the talents. And in that parable, a wealthy man who's going on a long journey leaves three of his slaves as stewards of all of his wealth, his possessions, and his finances. One was given five, one, two, and another one. And the same word is used here of God, of Almighty God, in reference to his stewardship, okay? It's the Greek word uh, oikonomia, oikonomia, which we looked at back then. And it basically means, it comes from the root, which means a house distributor or a house manager or an overseer, okay? And this word means administration. That could be of a household or a state. And here, specifically, in terms of a religious economy or a dispensation or a stewardship, Okay, one of my lexicons says that it's basically the management of a household or of household affairs. So here what we have in this instance of Paul being given his role and responsibility of ministry, we have God in this authoritative role as like a, a heavenly manager, as like a heavenly overseer, a steward and an administrator. Basically God here, I like to think things simple, He's the boss, all right? He's the big boss, man. He's in charge, and he oversees all of his affairs on earth. Can we agree on that? He administers, he oversees, he manages all things that concern his will, his plan, his purposes on this earth and in the heavens. You see, all of his creation is under his stewardship, under his stewardship, under his administration, and under his oversight. Look, listen to these wonderful... There's a lot of scripture tonight, and I hope you don't mind that. Um, we're going to read a few Psalms together. Psalms 24. And these, these scriptures concern this one true God who rules and reigns over all. We've got Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Amen. Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. Because of your mercy, because of your truth, why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? Listen to this, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. There it is. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 135, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Can you say amen to that? Israel for his special treasure. I don't have time to get into that tonight, but that's good. That's good. Slide eight. For I know that the Lord is great, and for our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. And what about these words from Job? But he is unique and who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me and many such things are with him. We all know what what the story of Job, an incredible book in the scriptures. Church, God is the heavenly steward. He's the heavenly steward. The one who holds the office. Okay, if you were to go to heaven right now and there's a door with manager written on it, God is in there. He's in there. He's the manager, he's the overseer, and he is the administrator. And he chose Paul. He chose this man that was killing his followers. He chose Paul. He wanted Paul as part of his divine plan. And he, and he wanted Paul to fulfill <clears throat> his purpose in the earth among his people. You see, church, Paul was in this place, in this very position, with the role and responsibility of bringing the good news, the gospel, to the nations, to the people of Israel, because God wanted him there. That's why Paul was there. In God's wisdom, in, in his role and office of this heavenly steward, God picked out Paul. He literally handpicked him and appointed him as a minister of his purpose and his plan, and he called him. 
And just to back this up, let's read words in, uh, that Paul wrote to the Galatian church. And I love this. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Okay? And then we're, then we're jumping down to verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of mine own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles or among the nations, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. But when God, but when God, Amen. God put a stop to all that Paul was doing. You see, Paul was going on about his life, but God had a plan for him that Paul really knew nothing about. Paul knew nothing about the change that was about to happen in his life. You know, I love how God can sometimes surprise us. He can, and he certainly surprised Paul. God can surprise us, and he can use us in ways that we never thought possible, or maybe in a ministry that we never thought possible, or serving in a way that we never thought possible. I know, I, I know, and I love how God can surprise us with his plans and his purposes for our lives. Not our plans, but his we can know nothing about it whatsoever. And then, boom, the Damascus Road and life is suddenly different and we're, what, and we're where God wants us. He calls, he places, he gives the rules and responsibilities. It's by his administration, by his governance and his oversight. Now, here's an important thing. In his time, in his time. And now was the right time for Paul. God, look, we, we read there that God had set him apart from his mother's womb. That's incredible in itself, and I don't even have time to get into that. And Paul knew nothing about this. But now Paul had been called by God's amazing grace, having Jesus, the Son of God, revealed to him on that Damascus road, and now he was doing what God designed and destined him to do. He was preaching to the nations. He was bringing the gospel to the nations. He was called to bring the good news of salvation, the very power of salvation to the nations by the stewardship of Almighty God. And Paul tells his friends in Colossae, whom he has never met, that God gave him this specific ministry for them. For them. He writes this. We've already read it, but I want to pick out two words. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me, say it with me, for you, for you. God had a purpose in Paul. We know that. God had a plan in Paul. We know that. And God was working out, working out both in this new minister of the gospel. But to what end? Well, Paul has just told us, for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Amen. Amen. To fulfill the word of God, the mystery, or to fulfill the word of God, the secret, or to fulfill the word of God, the hidden truth. You know, this word translated as fulfill, we've looked at it before. It means to make full, something I will be later, hopefully, after I get my pizza. To make full, to fill up, to make replete. Do you remember we talked about cramming a net way back? That's what it means, to cram like a net. It means to satisfy, to execute, to finish, and to accomplish. Church, do you see what Paul was trying to say to the Colossian believers? God was using Paul to accomplish, to fill up, and to execute the very word of Almighty God. The very word. To fulfill the word of God. Now, 
I'm not going to fry anyone's brains tonight with this word, word, okay? It's the word logos, okay? We, <laughs> you open any book to read about it, and it's about 100 pages. So I'm going to try and make it really simple, okay? This word logos, okay, from a root meaning, simply something said, including the thought, okay? So it's something said, including the thought behind what's being said. It can be a topic, a reasoning, or a motive. And I love this. It can also be the divine expression or the divine word, okay? It can be used of speech or of the mind alone. Look, the, the Greek, the actual Greek sentence here in the, in the Greek word order is like this. To make replete the something said, the God, the secret. Okay, so that's what's translated in our Bibles. To make replete the something said, the God, the secret. Okay? And we all know the famous opening passage in John's Gospel. There, you could all say it back to me. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word, the Logos, was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the Word, the Logos, became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. Now, we're, not, we're leaving it there tonight. I'll let Alan deal with Logos, okay, <laughs> or somebody else. But here in this passage to the Colossians, Paul writes of this word, this Logos of God, this thought, this mind, this reasoning of God as some kind of mystery, as a secret, as a hidden truth that has been kept from ages past, from generations past until now, but, and now it's been revealed to the saints. But what is this mystery? This mysterion, that's the Greek word, mysterion. This secret, this, this hidden truth. Well, you know, we know that in the Old Testament that we have many prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, the Messiah, coming to reveal God's truth and redemptive plan to his people Israel and for his people Israel. And the prophets who spoke the words of God to the kingdoms of Israel and to Judah, to God's people, spoke of a time in the future when something incredible would happen and God's plan for salvation would be fully realized in the one who was called the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. But understand, the prophets did not know what this plan was and what it would entail, not fully. They were only given so much of the story of this mystery that would be revealed in Jesus Christ. You know, the prophets could only work with what God gave them. All they could do was give to the people what God had given to them. We have in the Old Testament phrases like the Son of Man, found in Daniel 7. And you know, the Jews themselves had a phrase, the word of Jehovah, which is found in some of their Aramaic targums, okay? Add to this that around the time of Jesus, there was much uh, fervent and heated debate and much talk about who this Messiah was, what form he would take, what he would look like, in the sense of his purpose, words, and deeds. Who would this Messiah be? They were all asking this. When was he coming? What would he do? And you know, all of this was based around a, a kind of Jewish apocalyptic idea. And the idea was this, that there are hidden things which at some time must be revealed. There are secret spiritual things which must eventually be disclosed. You see, their line of thinking went like this, that God's plan was in a way hidden in heaven, but that God would start to draw back the curtain and reveal it to his people. You see, they knew all the prophecies. They had the debates. They had the talks. But they, they kind of only had half the picture. They only had half the story because the curtain had not yet been fully drawn open. But church, God had a plan. And this mystery, this hidden truth, this divine secret would be revealed and now had been revealed to the believers in Colossae. I love this passage from Galatians, all right? I love, Gal I love every book in the Bible. I love the whole Bible. Let's just say that. But Galatians 4, I love it so much. 
Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Isn't it funny, whenever you study a word in the Bible, you start to see it more? <laughs> They're stewards again, until the appointed time by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under, under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons and daughters. Let's add that in as well. Amen. Did you hear that? But when the fullness of time had come, what did I say earlier? It's all in God's time. He is the great heavenly administrator an overseer, and nothing in his plan and purpose happens without his doing and in the right time. And you know what, church? When God does it, guess what? Nothing stops it. Nothing stops it. And here we find out that when the, t the fullness of time had come, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the divine nature, tabernacled in skin and bone, just like ours, was born to a beautiful woman, Mary, born of a woman, and soon the mystery hidden from those ages past and all those generations would be revealed. Paul was saying to the Colossians, those before Christ could only see half the picture, not the full one. They saw through a veil, or to use a phrase from the Bible, through a glass darkly. Brenda already said it before I'd even said it. But you know where I'm going? Through a glass darkly, having part of the truth, but not all of it. But now, Paul says, my faithful in Colossa, you have the fullness of time on your side, and the truth has been fully revealed to you, the truth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the Redeemer, the one who has bought the reconciliation of God with his own blood. This is the mystery. This is the truth that was hidden. This is the Word of God fulfilled, completely and in its totality, church. Paul was saying, you are his saints and you get to live in this life-changing truth as we do. You see, there's nothing hidden now concerning God's plan of salvation. There's nothing more to find out. It's all been fully revealed. There's nothing to still be revealed concerning God's purpose in reconciliation and redemption. It's all been revealed. Because Jesus Christ, the sovereign and supreme sustainer, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the God manifest in flesh, the one born of this woman, church, He is the revealed truth. He is the mystery that is now revealed to all of us. Isn't that great? The glass darkly, this glass has been made, it's been wiped clear, and the veil has been removed by God the Father, and now we all can be reconciled to Him. Look, Paul has made it so clear. We can be in no doubt. His ministry and his calling was to fulfill the Word of God by bringing the good news to the nations, by bringing this hope of the gospel to the people there in Asia Minor, including those in Colossae. And he has now. And now they know the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what He has done. Look, I'm glad that God didn't keep the mystery hidden for all of eternity. But in the fullness of time, in His time, He sent forth His Son, His only begotten Son, born of a woman under the law to rescue and save those who were caught under its power. And now there's no more mystery. It's been fully revealed. And Jesus Christ is that full revelation. He's the one in whom it pleased the Father to have all the divine fullness dwell. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Church, we are like those saints in Colossa, his most holy and sacred things. I talked about it a few weeks ago. He sees you as holy, as sacred, as consecrated. Amen. So would you act like it? <laughs> I'm speaking to myself too. We, remember, we've got to play our part. And we've received this revelation that God was in Christ Amen. reconciling the word to himself. Praise the Lord. Amen. Look, I'll stop there tonight or I'll get going again.
And I've really enjoyed studying for this and bringing you this tonight, and I hope you've been blessed. Church, let me read for you the passage that we considered this evening, but in a, in a more modern translation. And take this with you tonight. I do hope every week you take something with you. Take out tonight, knowing who you are in Christ, all that he has done for you, and all that he has accomplished for you, and for all the saints that he loves and cares for. He loves you and he cares for you. This is in the easy to read version. So hopefully most of you will understand this. I know you're not stupid. You look stupid, but I know you're not stupid. I am happy in my sufferings for you. There is much that, must, that Christ must still suffer. And I gladly accept my part of those sufferings in my body for the good of his body, the church. Paul says, I became a servant of the church because God gave me a special work to do. This work helps you. My work is to tell the complete message of God. This message is the secret truth that was hidden since the beginning of time. It was hidden from everyone for ages, but now it has been made known to God's people. Amen? Amen. And let me leave you with the Apostle Paul's wonderful, it's a beautiful benediction to the followers of Jesus in Rome which fits perfectly with our study this evening, in which Paul speaks of this mysterion, this mystery, once again. It's Romans 16, 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Look, Paul was the minister. God was and is the manager. And the mystery, and there's the mystery that has been revealed to us all, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. Church, the ministry, the minister, <laughs> the minister, the manager, and the mystery. I hope you've been blessed by this short study tonight. Why don't we stand together and we're going to sing a beautiful <laughs> hymn together.